Hello everyone, I am Sammy, your devoted manga otaku, and welcome to my manga space. Today I will be discussing all the manga I read in the month of May, and we're just going to jump into things because I read quite a few books this month and I have a lot of thoughts I'd like to share. So I invite you to grab a coffee or other beverage of your choice and let's talk manga. The first manga series I want to talk about today is one that I found a little disappointing to be honest and that's the completed shoujo series Starcrossed by Junko. This Kodansha series is fairly short, it's only four volumes long and it follows a high school student named Azusa. Azusa is completely obsessed with her favorite pop star Chika and while attending one of his concerts, both Azusa and Chika end up dying in a freak accident. Luckily, both their souls are sent back to Earth, however, there's a bit of a mix-up and their souls end up switching bodies. Now, when I started this series, I actually had pretty low expectations going in because I knew this series had fairly mixed reviews, which is why I was so surprised with how much I enjoyed the first couple books. I thought the story and the characters were cute and funny, and I think the overall concept of the manga is great. Having a famous idol switch bodies with one of his adoring fans makes for some great comedy, but halfway through the third volume, I realized that this series was probably going to have some issues, and I was right, unfortunately. The biggest problem I have with this series is that the ending was very rushed and kind of confusing. It felt like Junko Sensei needed to end the story for some reason. Maybe the manga wasn't selling well, or the manga was cancelled because of the pandemic, or perhaps Junko Sensei had other reasons for ending the series. Either way, the manga felt like it should have been six or seven volumes long because certain things just don't make sense to me. I felt like the climax wasn't foreshadowed enough. It felt very wacky, like way wackier than the rest of the series. It almost felt out of place and the final conclusion was super underwhelming. Plus, both side characters and subplots fell by the wayside in order to focus on wrapping up the main storyline, which was frustrating. <laughs> Another problem with rushing the conclusion was that the characters didn't have enough time to develop and grow, especially the main character, Azusa. Azusa was an interesting protagonist. She wasn't necessarily likable. She reminded me of the girls in, sh in shoujo manga that create fan clubs for the popular boys at school. Her infatuation and obsession with Chica was actually pretty toxic and I was anticipating some conversations around the problems with celebrity idolizing culture, but it didn't happen. And because it didn't happen, it was hard for me to accept the romance between Chica and Azusa. Plus their chemistry was literally non-existent. It seemed like Chica was weirded out by Azusa more than anything. I actually have a theory, and this might be mild spoil, spoil, spoiler territory here, but I don't think Azusa and Chica were originally supposed to end up together. Both characters have other love interests in the books, and I think they were supposed to end up with those characters as sort of a twist but without time to develop, those relationships couldn't be established properly. It's a shame that this series ended so badly because I felt like it had a lot of potential. The story started off strong, it was funny, and I really like the artwork. It's super cute and well drawn. I'm giving this series two and a half stars and I don't really recommend you pick this up. However, if you're interested in checking out some of Junko Sensei's other work, I've heard great things about their other series, Kiss Him Not Me. I haven't read it, 
but it has great reviews on Goodreads. Now, another month has come and gone, which means I got to read another installment of the classic series, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon The Eternal Edition by Naoko Takauchi, and this month I read Volume 4. This book wrapped up the Black Moon arc and introduces one of my favorite Sailor Moon characters, Black Lady, or Wicked Lady if you know her from the anime dub like I do. When I was a kid, I really, really liked her character design. And even now, Black Lady is a character I would love to cosplay one day. There were some things I really liked about this manga and some elements that I thought were kind of strange. First off, I thought Black Lady and Mamoru's relationship was very taboo. Both characters are being possessed by Wise Man and the Beguiling Black Crystal, so it's not like they're acting of their own accord but it was a little weird. Another thing that bothered me in this volume was Sailor Moon and the Senshi leaving mid-battle to go back to their own time and rest. It just felt really jarring because it's not like there's a lull in the battle or anything, they just left. <laughs> and then the last criticism I'll mention is an issue I had with the last volume as well, and that's that the Sailor Senshi are completely underutilized. I'm worried that this is going to be a trend, especially since the Outer Senshi are going to start making their appearances. I really hope I'm wrong and that they'll shine a little more in later volumes. I think the highlight of the book for me was Sailor Pluto. I loved that she was the catalyst for Chibiusa's transformation due to their bond and friendship. I really hope we'll see more Sailor Pluto in later volumes. I just really like her character. <laughs> there are two short stories at the end of this volume. One focuses on Chibiusa and the other focuses on Rei. Both stories help fill out more background information for these characters but I think Ray's story was stronger. I thought it was interesting that in the translation notes it mentions that Ray's favorite flower is a white lily because Takeuchi Sensei had lunch with the actress that voiced Ray in the anime and her favorite flowers were white lilies. It's cool how the voice actress actually inspired some of Ray's personality. As always, let's take a look at some of the chapter art in this book. First we have this gorgeous full spread. And there was a picture of, a colored picture of Black Lady and oh, she just looks so pretty. I love her costume and hair design so much. She's such a gorgeous character. This was another four star read for me. I'm still enjoying my time with this series and I look forward to the next volume, especially since we're getting into unknown territory. I know a tiny bit of information regarding the outer Sailor Senshi, but not much. <laughs> I can't wait to see what the Sailor Mooniverse has in store next month. And then we have a series that actually isn't in my collection. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen me post about finding volumes one and two of the Seinen series Mushishi by Yuki Yuroshibara through a program offered by my local library where you can actually order and borrow books from other libraries in my province. The series is completed at 10 volumes and is actually out of print. English volumes sell for hundreds of dollars, so I was super excited when I found these. Now, I love the anime, so I kind of knew what to expect going into this, but I was surprised to find just how closely the anime follows the manga, which doesn't always happen. Mushishi is a collection of surreal stories set in an imaginary time between the Edo and Meiji periods and follows Ginko, a Mushi master, also known as a Mushishi. 
Ginkgo has the skills necessary to see Mushi, which are ubiquitous, primitive life forms with supernatural powers. Mushishi often cling to their hosts to survive, kind of like parasites, and Ginkgo chooses to wander the Japanese countryside using his knowledge and skills in order to save those plagued by Mushi. I believe most of the stories in these books are inspired by Japanese folklore, legends, and superstitions. It's all very dreamlike and fascinating. I enjoyed these volumes a lot, but I did find some of the chapters borderline boring at times just because the pacing is very slow and calm but then you get chapters like the veil spore which features a mushi that kills children and takes their place sort of like a changeling and that was very unsettling <laughs> i would say most of the stories are creepy and sometimes bleed into the horror genre they remind me a lot of ghost stories. If you've read Mermaid Saga by Rumiko Takahashi, I feel like Mushishi is very similar to that series. Mermaid Saga is also a collection of short stories that are very vague and creepy. You don't get much in the way of explanations or, or, or overarching plot. I do like Mushishi more than Mermaid Saga. I think I rated Mermaid Saga three or three and a half stars, whereas this series is definitely a solid four stars for me. Unfortunately, the other volumes available through the interlibrary program are volumes three, six, and seven. I don't really like reading manga online, so I might stop reading this, I'm not sure. I think it's bizarre that a manga that won the Kodansha Manga of the Year award is so hard to find. To buy the whole series in English, secondhand, will cost you anywhere from two to three thousand dollars, and that's ridiculous. This series deserves a hardcover or omnibus reprint, in my opinion. <laughs> the artwork in this series is pretty, the stories are very nature oriented so you often see beautiful, lush illustrations and backgrounds. Ginkgo is a very mysterious protagonist. He's kind and laid back, but besides that, you don't know much about him. In conclusion, I love the blend of faux biology, mythology, and creepiness, as well as the gentle and peaceful storytelling. If you have the resources to read Mushishi, I do recommend that you check it out. This next series is another one that I've rated for stars, and that's the completed series Boys Run the Riot by Keito Gaku. This Kodansha publication is four volumes long and is an own voices manga with the story stemming from Gaku Sensei's own experiences, as he is also a trans man. The manga follows a transgender boy named Ryo who is struggling with his gender and how the world perceives him. He recognizes and understands that he identifies as trans, but he doesn't feel like he can confide in any of his friends or family. The only time Ryo feels at ease and comfortable is in his free time, where he dresses in his favorite clothes. After meeting and befriending a boy named Jin, a new transfer student with a similar taste in fashion, the two decide to develop their own fashion brand, which jumpstarts Ryo's journey of self-discovery using street fashion as a way to express himself to the world. Boys Run the Riot is a really amazing manga with meaningful storytelling and messaging. First, you have Ryo's journey of becoming comfortable in his own skin and living his life his way, which was both powerful and impactful. Even though Ryo is facing bullying and transphobia, watching him persevere with the help of his friends and allies is truly inspiring. And then you have the fashion aspects of the manga. And I'll be honest, going into this series, I thought we'd be following a group of boys starting a fashion brand in order to create clothes that would help people express themselves. And while that's all true, it's more about doing what you love with people that you love. It's important to strive for success, but you should recognize that things could fail 
and that's okay. It's all about the journey. It's about honing your skills, making new connections, and just having fun following your passions. One issue I did have with this series was the final volume. The conclusion was okay, but it fell a bit flat for me and was a little more open-ended than I would have liked. I felt like the series aimed to discuss a lot of topics, but there just wasn't enough time to flesh everything out and some plot threads aren't fully resolved. I really think the series would have benefited from more volumes or even an epilogue. I would have loved to see a glimpse of the boys' future and what became of their fashion brand. I thought the characters were all great. They all had distinct personalities and great character development. My favorite character was definitely Jin. He was an awesome friend and a great example of a supportive and respectful ally. I thought the artwork was really good, but I was under the impression that there'd be more graphic and fashion designs. I would have loved to see some of the fashion designs from the manga covers make their way into the manga. Lastly, I really appreciated the mangaka including their award-winning short story that inspired the series at the end of the final volume. It's a powerful, albeit harrowing, story centering around a trans teenager trying to live his life as his authentic self. The tone is heavier than Boys Run the Riot, but it's fierce and just as moving as the main manga. It's important to note that these books include transphobia, bullying, and a public outing just in case that's triggering for you. The LGBTQ plus representation is great in this. The story, although dark at times, is overall very wholesome and feel good. Plus, it's only four volumes long, so you don't have to worry about investing in a ton of books. Also, another fun fact about this series, when licensing the publication in English, Kodansha hired an all-transgender localization team to edit and translate the manga, which is really awesome. I love that. Like I said at the beginning of my review, I'm giving this series four stars, and if you're looking for a new manga to read for Pride Month, this is a really wonderful option. Up next, we have a series that I haven't read in a long time, and honestly, I forgot just how addicting it was, and that's Volume 7 and 8 of the Jose series, Something's Wrong With Us by Natsumi Ando. I recently learned that this Kodansha series was completed in Japan at 16 volumes, which is insane to me. It's hard to believe that we're only halfway through the story because so much has happened already. The narrative follows a young woman named Nao who discovered her passion for traditional Japanese confectionery, also known as wagashi, from her mother who was a professional wagashi maker and worked in a celebrated wagashi shop. When Nao was little, some shocking events took place and her mother was accused of murdering the owner of the shop she worked at. Unfortunately, before the trial, Nao's mother passed away suddenly, and now 15 years later, Nao is determined to prove her mother's innocence by getting close to the only person who witnessed the crime, the late shop owner's son, Subaki. In the last couple weeks, I learned that some people have been dropping this series, and all right, Soap operas aren't for everyone, but for me, this series is so much fun. These volumes had me at the edge of my seat. I love the mystery, I love the suspense, and of course, the drama. <laughs> also, learning about Wagashi has been fascinating and helps the story stand apart from other dramas. I love seeing how the Wagashi are made and watching the characters create and reveal inventive designs. It's all very interesting. I can't say too much about the story for obvious reasons, but what I will say is that the end of volume seven sparks a huge shift 
in the story and things become quite different. I wasn't too sure how to feel at first, but after reading volume 8, I really like the direction the story is taking. Even though I find one of the new characters frustrating. It's no fault of theirs, I just see them getting in the way a lot. <laughs> I'm giving these volumes 5 stars and I've already pre-ordered the next volume. I'm very curious to see where this new story arc will take our main characters. And the second last manga I need to talk about is volume 3 of the shoujo rom-com Lovesick Ellie by Fujimomo. Lovesick Ellie is completed in Japan at 12 volumes and it looks like we're going to be getting this series in English pretty quickly because we've been getting a new volume every couple months and it's been awesome. I have quite a few ongoing series in my collection that are releasing new volumes very slowly, so I'm really liking this release schedule. Lovesick Ellie is a super fluffy and wholesome Kodansha series following a couple of teenagers. You've got Omi, a popular student who is secretly two-faced and Eriko, an invisible nobody who's somewhat of a pervert. <laughs> you see, she has this habit of fabricating wild fantasies about Omi and posting them all over her fake Twitter account under the pseudonym Lovesick Ellie. The volumes navigate this quirky relationship between these two individuals who are able to be their true selves around each other. Like its predecessors, this installment was super adorable and hilarious. We have Ellie obsessing over what her first kiss with Omi might be like, and we're introduced to a new character, Sarah's childhood friend Rio. There's definitely an interesting relationship dynamic between Sarah and her friend, and I'm curious about what's going on. There was some miscommunication between some of the characters, which I usually find annoying, but it's resolved pretty quickly and in the cutest way possible, so I don't mind. <laughs> I'm still really enjoying the series. I love how it ended with the introduction of a possible new antagonist. This series is still five stars for me, and if you like shoujo, I think you'll love this manga. The last manga I want to talk about today is probably the book I was most excited to read this month, and that's Volume 7 of the ongoing series Spy Family by Tetsuya Endo. My hype around this series has skyrocketed because my husband and I have been watching the newly released anime and we haven't missed a Saturday yet. It's one of our favorite parts of the weekend. So when I finally hauled this new installment, I just wanted to jump right into it and find out what happens next. And let me tell you, it did not disappoint. <laughs> I probably sound like a broken record by now because I think most people know the basic storyline of Spy Family, but essentially the narrative follows a fake family. We have the creator and husband of the fam, Lloyd Forger, also known as Twilight, a master spy who's using this family in his mission to save the world. We have his wife, Your Forger, who's secretly a deadly assassin known as the Thorn Princess, and then we have Anya Forger, the only person to know everyone's secrets and true self because she's secretly a mind reader. Volume 6 ended on a cliffhanger with this volume picking up right where it left off, and it was extremely satisfying to see that whole scene play out. <laughs> Afterwards, the rest of the chapters delve into different side stories and plots, with the focus switching between multiple side characters, including Damien, Anya's bratty classmate, Frankie, the fun uncle, and Yuri, yours brother, who I feel gets a bad rep. I actually really like Yuri, I think he's funny, and I'm, and I'm excited to see what Endo Sensei does with his character. I think what I enjoyed the most, though, was getting to see more of Damien's character. I like that we get to see more things from 
his perspective. Also, it's always fun seeing Damien and Anya interact with each other. They are so adorable. <laughs> The end of the volume marks the beginning of a new story arc, which is really exciting and it looks like it'll be focusing primarily on Twilight, Yor, and Anya. It looks like things are going to get a little crazy for the Forger family and I can't wait. Overall, this manga continues to be super cute, wholesome, and hilarious. I love the mixture of comedy, action, and slice of life elements. It's all well balanced and well written. I'm really bummed that the release schedule for this series is so slow. The next volume won't be out until the end of September. However, there's only nine volumes released in Japan at the moment, so we just have to be patient. I just have to be patient. <laughs> Also, I don't want to rush Endo Sensei. I'm sure it takes a lot of time and energy to write this amazing story, and I want the characterization and the storytelling to be the best it can be. And with that, we have finally come to the end of May's manga wrap up. If you've read any of these manga, I would love to know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, just a heads up, I will be combining my June and July wrap ups because I'm going on vacation and I don't have time to film one for June. I'll still be posting other content, just don't expect to see another wrap up until the end of July. If you're interested in watching more videos from me, you can check out my end card where I'll have links to my most recent videos. I hope you all have a magnificent day and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!